Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, chapter 19, the great book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, he whom God launches forth. God really used this man. They even chose him before he entered his mother's womb. And while in the womb, designated him, designated him as prophet. And so naturally, he speaks the Word of God, God speaking through him. He has just told him in the last chapter, chapter 18 that we covered, to go down to the potter's house. I'll show you what it's like, what I'm trying to do to people here. I never, I never bring a completed marred vessel. I redo it. And that's what God does with his children's lives when they ask him. And now we continue with that thought. And we pick it up in chapter 19, verse 1. And that word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, Thus saith the Lord, go and get a potter's earthen vessel, earthen bottle, that is, take of the ancients of the people and of the ancients of the priest. You get the elders together and you, you take of them and have them to, um, to understand this. But it's important that you know what this uh, word bottle is in the Hebrew tongue. It is bachka. And it comes from when you take a bottle and have it full of water and turn it over to empty it, it goes baka, 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 baka. In other words, that's where the name comes from. Real easy to check it out in your Strong's Concordance. Baka. Okay, verse 2. That's important. It'll come up again. It means emptying out. All right. Verse 2. And go forth unto the valley of the son of Hinnon, which is by the entry of the east gate, and proclaim there the words that I shall tell thee. Now, there's a little defutility there that we cannot let stand. Uh, naturally, the, out the east gate, you have the valley um, Kedron. And uh, the scribes mistook the word um, haras instead of uh, using haris. Haris means potsherd. And what God is saying, you take that bottle and you go to the potter's gate. And you need to know the history to that potter's gate and the 30 pieces of silver that would be paid for the, for the um, uh, deliverance of the Savior and that that 30 pieces of silver paid for that potter's field. A field where old bottles are put, but Christ can put them back together. Lives cast out and broken, Christ can mend. Christ can make them well. Christ can put um, families back together. So it's important that we realize we're talking here, hares, which is to say potsherd or potter's gate. Verse 3, And say, Hear ye the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, the, the which whosoever heareth, his ears shall tingle. Now, what's happening, I mean, and, uh, the king of Babylon is just over the hill. And that's Nebuchadnezzar of the old time. But prophetically speaking, it's the king of Babylon of the end times, the great book of Revelation, it's the Antichrist. And what he's saying, Jerusalem is going to be stood on its head there. Why? Because as it is written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, um, before we gather back to the Lord Jesus Christ, the false Messiah, son of perdition, will stand in the holy place, that's Jerusalem, claiming to be God. He said, because you, you don't study, I'm going to fix your wagon right real good. That's just laying it down where the rubber meets the road, friend. Verse 4, because they have forsaken me. They won't listen to anything. 
and have estranged this place and have burned incense in it unto other gods whom neither they nor their fathers have known nor the kings of Judah and have filled this place with the blood of innocence. That, that is to say misleading and deceiving people into to, um, false doctrine, into following even to the point that many will worship the king of Babylon thinking he is the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that's a disgrace. That, that'll make you tingle all right. When, when you think of people that have churched themselves all their life, meaning well, but never having been truly taught about the chronological order of events that consummate the end of this age, whereby, in fact, they, they, um, have, they listen to man. And what does man say? You don't have to understand God's word. You're going to be gone. Now, anytime you will listen to a man instead of God, do you remember, you remember what it said back in the 17th chapter? It comes to my mind. 17th chapter, verse 5. Do you remember what God said there? Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man instead of Almighty God. He's talking to you. He's letting you know how it's going down. You can count on it. Many innocents, they, they, they mean well, but because of false teachers, they're going to be misled. Verse 5 to continue. They have built also the high places of Baal. The high places is a shrine, a place of worship to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not, nor spake it, neither came it into my mind. And you know, it is really a shame when Christians, um, little old Christians will be, that we have a God of love, and they'll take a child or a teenager and tell them, God's going to burn you in hell. It never entered God's mind. It, rather to treat them and teach them properly where there is even no danger of an innocent ending up in that place. It never entered God's mind, but it sure will Satan's. And Satan likes to have company right to the very doorstep of that lake of fire. So, but God said, I never, I've never even uh, thought about you sacrificing your children to false religion and false teachings. You know, the, the homicide of the soul is more serious than homicide of the flesh. You're dealing with God's property. All souls belong to God. And um, Ecclesi uh, in, in the great book of Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, you don't get around to giving your soul to God. He owns it. And he will allow you to go astray if you don't listen to his word. Verse 6 to continue. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that this place shall no more be called Tophat, nor the valley of the son of Hinnon. Tophat means burning. There's no more going to be called the valley of the burning, and Hinnon meaning lamentation but the valley of slaughter. In other words, um, spiritual deception and spiritual death, deader than a hammer spiritually because of false teaching again. Verse 7, And I will make void the counsel of Judah and Jerusalem in this place, and I will cause them to fall by the sword before their enemies, and by the hands of them that seek their lives, that's to say their souls, and their carcasses will I give to be meat for the fowls of the heaven and for the beasts of the earth. That's, and, and at that seventh trump, all are changed instantly into spiritual bodies, and so it is. There is a word in this verse that you need to know from the Hebrew tongue. It is the word void little different than in most places than words that are translated void. Do you know what this word void here is in the Hebrew tongue? It's baka, 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 baka. In other words, baka one time. It's a bottle emptied out. In other words, um, 
If you've ever had an old gallon jug filled with water and you turn it over, that's the sound it makes, okay? A pottery, a piece of pottery or a, a, a bottle. Book, 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 book. And so it is. That's what God gets your attention. And that's what the word means. It's unusual for the word void to be translated from baka, emptying. But um, that's, that's what he intends to do with the place. And it will be emptied of proper teachers other than those that are delivered up before the false Messiah. Um, our Father has a, a, a plan. All you have to do is follow it. Men will lead you astray. This man and that man, they dream and get daydreams and so forth. Why not just stick to the Scripture and be informed rather than dreaming? Verse 8, And I will make this city desolate, and in hissing it will be a shame. Everyone that passeth thereby shall be a stoned uh, and hiss because of all the plagues thereof. Uh, and when you realize what's really going on there, the whole world pouring into that place, worshiping the devil himself, playing the role of Antichrist. You talk about utter contempt. You talk about desolation by the desolator, the abomination standing where it ought not in the holy place that Daniel the prophet taught us about how precious it is to know the truth in the chronological order of events that consummate the end of this age. Because this great miracle at that seventh trump when in a wink and a twinkle of an eye we're changed into spiritual bodies and Christ returns and we overcome this mess. But this will happen to that place before that event transpires and you've got things to do there if you have a destiny. If God has his hand on you, if you have a purpose. Verse 9, And I will cause them to eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters, and they shall eat every one the flesh of his friend in the siege and straightness wherewith their enemies and they that seek their lives shall straighten them. They're going to be troubled on every side. How? how how, how is it? What do they mean, eat the flesh of their own children and so forth? Do you know why God hated Esau? God hated Esau because he cared nothing for his heritage. I mean, he traded it for a bowl of mush, and he was, he was the firstborn in the line of uh, Israel. Firstborn. And Jacob, God loved. Why? He cared about truth, about the Scripture, about doing what God wanted. So even today, if you do not, if you do not, I'm not trying to put anybody on a guilt trip because many people don't know, but if you don't teach your children who they truly are and what God's hand means to them, then you're, just, you're, you're um, um, dissipating their flesh as far as making it into basically heathenism or nothing when Christ paid an awesome price that we can all have salvation, that he was that seed that would come through that house, and that those that are of that, of that um, understanding have work to do. They have a destiny and a purpose, that this is, just isn't living from one day to the next in this flesh earth. But God's children are exactly that. They are his children. He created all the tribes. That is to say, he created on the sixth day all the races, and he loves every one of them. And on the eighth day, he created Eth Ha'adam, which is what we're talking about here, the heritage of that through which the Christ, the Savior, would come. And how precious it is. They just throw it out the window. I mean, teach against it, burning incense, teaching false religion, and never sticking on track as to what your destiny and purpose is. Verse 10, Then shalt thou break the bottle in the sight of the men that go with thee. I mean, you empty it, and then you take it to that potter's gate, and you throw it out, and you break it into a thousand pieces. And, and right in, in their sight. 
Well, what does that signify? Verse 11, And shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Even so will I break this people and this city as one breaketh a potter's vessel that cannot be made whole again. And they shall bury them in Tophat, that place of burning, till there be no place to bury. And um, spiritually dead by the droves, the whole world whores after the false messiah. <clears throat> what a sad day that's going to be. You, you miss the whole pattern and truth. If you do not understand about the potter's gate, the potter's field, it was purchased. What, what happened to that 30 pieces of silver that Judas threw back down on that temple floor? It rang throughout that temple. It was picked back up. And those 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave, that's what was paid for the Messiah. And those 30 pieces of silver bought that potter's field. And what, what God is letting you know behind the scene here is that no, man can't put that pot back together, that bottle. Man cannot touch it. He's, man destroys man, and cursed be the person that puts their trust in man when they have the Savior, because he can take that bottle, baka, and he can put it all back together. And these earthen vessels, which are our bodies, that people so easily mislead and throw away, not realizing they are throwing them away, but not knowing their heritage, misleading, misguiding, not, not mentioning the signpost that God gives in His Word, warnings of when you're going off path, whereby you can get back into the Word of God and have the blessings of God on your family and your ministry, then you're in a heap of hurt if you listen to the traditions of men. Oh, but I'd just like to hear what men have to say. It's all right to listen to man, but you better document him in the Word of God. You do not have time for foolishness when you teach God's Word. That valley of burning, Tophat, there will be a lake of fire, but it will not come until the end of the millennium after the great white throne judgment, nobody is judged until God judges them at the end of the millennium, that thousand year period. What a, what a father we have, the patience, the love, the understanding, the touch that he gives through the comforter. He sends that comforter to you today that puts those old bottles back together and gives you purpose and meaning. How precious he is. Verse 12 to continue. Thus will I do unto this place. Remember the old shattered bottle. I'm going to do that to this place, saith the Lord, and to the inhabitants thereof. And even make this city as Tophat. I'm going to make Jerusalem as burning. Okay, That's what it's going to be like. Well, you can remember, what did Jesus say to the disciples in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 when he walked out of the city? They said to him, Master, look at these buildings. What did he say? He said, in the end, there will not be one stone left standing atop another. He's going to cleanse it, cleanse it from this mess. That is to say of the Antichrist standing in that holy place. And all that love the Lord will have, um, have be gone at that time, away from it, except those that are delivered up. Verse 13, and the houses of Jerusalem and the houses of the kings of Judah shall be defiled as the place of Tophat, that burning, because of all the houses upon whose roofs they have burned incense unto all the host of heaven, Ishtar, and so forth, and have poured out drink offerings unto other gods. You, you, want, you want to get something settled in your mind? God is jealous. He's very jealous. And He's also vengeful. He has given you the whole world. 
to work your way. I don't care where you're starting. That's, that's not as important as where you can go. When you work yourself up with God's blessings, never, never apologize for being rich in God's blessings. That's wonderful that God intends you to be. So, and, and if that's your purpose and His will. But at the same time, no one understand. You, you start worshiping traditions of men that make void the Word of God and expect God to bless you and what you do, forget it. It's, he's, our Father is not a fool. And He doesn't tolerate fools until they come to Him humbly, wanting His story. His, his story is history, the real history of, he, of our people and what he intends to do. You think he's going to do this? You can rest assured he's going to do it. There will be nothing there that is salvageable other than his own election and the remnant whereby he sins there. 14. Then came Jeremiah from Tophet whither the Lord had sent him to prophesy. And he stood in the court of the Lord's house, and he said to all the people, 15, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring upon this city and upon all her towns, that's the little joining neighborhoods, all the evil that I have pronounced against it, because they have Harden their necks, they have uh, that they might not hear my words. They're they're stiff necked, they're stubborn, their old foreheads are like iron. They will not listen to the truth. They would rather put their trust in man. You don't have to understand God's word. You're going to fly away. There's just one problem. There's not one scripture that says that. Where, where is he getting that from? The fact when God would say in 1 Thessalonians, those that are already asleep or dead, or if you believe Christ rose, they have also. You're, you're going to make that into flying away. They're with the Lord. And, and we, we all know from, from the Scripture that God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. They're all very much alive and they're with Him, waiting judgment. It, it upsets some Christians when you say, well, you mean they're in heaven? Who, who do you think is going to judge the, you? God is. Well, how do I go to the great white throne judgment? You go where He is. Because you are going to stand before Him, not somebody else. And that's why they wait there. And they will wait until the end of the millennium for that final judgment. You know, our Father, I, I can understand maybe why He gets discouraged at the children sometimes. They won't listen. He makes it so simple what He intends to do that He uses these analogies like of taking a piece of pottery, taking it to the gate, He crash it down. That's what's going to happen to you if you keep burning incense, keep listening to foolish people, false prophets, and ignore me. He will not be ignored. Chapter 20, verse 1. Now, Pasha, the son of Imar, Imar means talkative, so the priest, uh, uh, who was also chief governor in the house of the Lord, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. He heard it, he didn't like it. I mean, here he's kind of called the most noble kind of a title, and his, his daddy, the old priest, is talkative, very talkative, maybe ratchet join. Verse 2, And then Pasher smote Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. Now, when you take a man that God has chosen and you put him in stocks, you might want to really be concerned about that. Verse 3, And it came to pass on the morrow that Pasher brought forth Jeremiah out of the stocks. Then said Jeremiah unto him, 
he's still not going to like this either. The Lord hath not called thy name Pasha, but Megor Mishabeb. In other words, uh, you're not most noble. God didn't give it to you. Your talkative pappy may have, but he didn't. It's an Aramaic name. God gave him a name, Terra on every side. And that's the way it's going to be. He touched a man of God. Verse 4, For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will make thee a terra to thyself, and to all thy friends, and they shall fall by the sword of their enemies. And thine eyes shall behold it. You're going to see it. And I will, emphatic, I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon. And he shall carry them captive into Babylon and shall slay them with the sword. Now, all the males of, of Zechariah, his sons and himself and the prophets, yes, he did. Even old Zechariah himself, I mean, he gouged him, led him like an animal and then finally would kill him. Uh, that came to pass. The king of Babylon did it. But then, too, how is it that the eyes are gouged out, meaning they don't see? In the end times, it's a little different. The king of Babylon is none other than the son of perdition. The son of perdition is the only one that already has a death sentence placed on his head. It happened back in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 and 19. It's none other than Satan himself. And certainly, um, as he comes forth, then when, when he appears and they follow him, then they are the same as their eyes gouged out. They're blind, blind to the truth. They're not going to know who they are worshiping. There was a, as always in God's doings, there is always that remnant left over to serve God from this destruction, which is an example of what it's going to be at the end in a spiritual sense. Jeremiah himself will be allowed by the king of Babylon to take the daughters of Zedekiah and they would go to Egypt and then later to Europe. And one of those daughters' names of Zedekiah was Skota. And from Skota today, we have Scotland. That's where Jeremiah settled. Jeremiah was called in Ireland and Scotland, Olenfala, who had a scribe named Baruch. Uh, Olenfala being the very wise person. That was Jeremiah. God has a way of saving those whom he will save for a purpose that God alone brings forth in his plan, his overall plan. You might say, well, is that scriptural? Well, yes, it is. The daughter's being spared. It certainly is. And um, we'll cover some of it in this book before we finish. But also, our history records it. Um, and so it is. Let's go with the next, one more verse, verse, uh, verse 5. Moreover, I, emphatic, I, will deliver all the strength of this city and all the laborers thereof and all the precious things thereof and all the treasures of the kings of Judah will I give unto the hand of their, of thy, their enemies which shall spoil them and take them and carry them to Babylon. What is Babel? It's Babel, confusion. You might say, well, all their labors thereof? Well, I don't know. What kind of labors do we have today? And where are your labors really going? And how are they stacking up? Are you doing real good? I um, uh, wonder how many jobless ones there are in the labors. And where, is the jobless, where are the jobs going? Um, God has a way of fulfilling prophecy. 
Sometimes you need to wake up and smell the, the very roses themselves of God's creation because God's creation lets you know and understand that these precious things, some of them are taking a powder. They're being lifted from the very children themselves of the house of Israel, not the house of Judah. Well, the house of Judah also, but especially the house of Israel. Verse 6, And thou, Pasha, you false preacher, and all that dwell in thine house shall go into captivity, and thou shalt come to Babylon. And he was dragged there. And there thou shalt die and shall be buried there, thou and all thy friends to whom thou hast prophesied lies. God doesn't like liars. He just will not tolerate them. There always comes that payday that judgment begins at the pulpit, and God help the pulpit that lies have gone forth from. It will not be a pretty sight. It will not be a pretty thing. But that's God's way of doing things. If there's, anyone, if there's any one group of people that he really holds to the count is priests, preachers, and prophets so-called that lie, I guarantee you they're going nowhere. And as it is written, judgment begins at the pulpit with those. You can rest assured. God is a God of love. Well, then pray tell me, how could he be so hard on preachers if he's a God of love? Because they're misleading his children. And that he does not like. That's what true love is about. is teaching properly and sometimes practicing tough love. God must do it. And so should the children, men and women of God, that bring forth the true word of God. Always a little tough love. It's a beautiful thing. Necessary and in following the very word of God in a very troubled world. Don't miss the next lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? Genesis 146, the first six chapters in God's word. The world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular tapes. How, was the, what, how and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you've always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, and all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination. We do not judge people. Teach God's word. Let the chips fall wherever they may. Never apologize for it. Our Father is in control. He's on the throne. He always will be. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Make sure you don't leave him. That is certainly possible. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Again, always a pleasure. Now, you got a prayer request. You don't need that number or an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. You don't even have to say it out loud. Why? He loves you. You're his child. He, he made you different than anyone else. Your DNA is different. And because he wanted someone just like you, but he doesn't want you burning incense or worshiping some other god. He wants you to worship him. That's why he created you for his pleasure, not somebody else's. So if you want to be, his, if you want to be blessed by him, you'll always let him know you love him.
Let's go to his throne. Father, around the world we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct. Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. Robert from Maine. Could a race of people that God created on the sixth day be no longer around, extinct? No, that's not possible. Our Father created people because He wanted them, and He always brings forth the, the, those that, are, that can be saved. Who are those that can be saved? Those that love Him, that listen to Him. Of all people, of all races, of all tribes. This, this has to do with salvation um, after the crucifixion. That blood on the cross is available for whomsoever will believe on that word of God. But it's got to be his word, not man's. Billy from Texas, is the son of man and the son of God the same person? Yes, it is. The, usually, <clears throat> the son of man refers to Christ walking the earth in the flesh. He is called the Son of Man. Why? Because he was born of woman. But the um, Son of God is after the resurrection or before, before the birth. Uh, prophecies there too. But Son of Man means Christ in the flesh, what he did here while on earth walking. The Word became flesh and walked among us. John chapter 1. Mary from Georgia where in the Bible does it say we are to put God in remembrance? Isaiah chapter 43, verse 26. <clears throat> you know, you don't really put God in remembrance. He doesn't forget anything. He wants to know if you know about his promises. Because if you know about his promises, it means you've studied his word. He wants you to claim that promise. He wants you to remind him of it, whereby you can discuss it, you and he, and consider it, and then he can justify you, which means he will make it right with you. Isaiah 43, verse 26. Diane from Florida. My husband recently passed, and I know he is with our father, but I would like to know, is he in his spiritual body already? Is he awake or asleep? Where is his soul? Does he know what is happening here on earth? Thanks so much. What are some scriptures I can refer to? Well, Isaiah, uh, you need to know Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, to be absent from this body is present with the Lord. Instantly, your spirit returns to the Father from which it came. That's your soul. And God is, uh, then read the last few verses of John chapter 8. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. No, no, not even Satan is dead. <clears throat> and they are instantly, the, spirit, the spiritual body dwells within this flesh body. And when that silver cord parts, that spiritual body steps out. It's a different dimension than the flesh and returns to the Father that gave it. Last scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, to be absent from the flesh is to be present with the Lord. Uh, William from uh, Arizona. Okay, I'm glad that you listened. My regiment was annihilated there in North Korea, and we that were able were transferred to another regiment. I was Army myself, but a Marine division was to our left flank. This is up at the Chosan Reservoir. He's heard me speak of it. I was there also. The Navy fire fighters did strafing for us I have and Marine. I have great respect for their daring work. I got cold chills just watching them come so close to the ground. My gun emplacement was on Hill 280, and those fighters would fly even with or below me. They would get down with it. My question is, were you a ground pounder like me or one of those daring pilots? If yes or no, I still thank you for that and also for the wonderful way you teach God's Word. Well, you're so welcome, William, and it's good to have you with us. I was, I was um, uh, a air-to-ground controlman, okay, for the 1st Marine Division. 
Michael from California. Is the person spoken about in Daniel 12, the Antichrist, the abomination that comes is the abominable one, the, the um, uh, very abomination that is set up, as it is written in that 12th chapter, is Antichrist on this earth. Uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 gives you the very fact that it is translated desolation, but the Hebrew is desolator, meaning an entity, not a condition. And yes, that is he. Uh, Barbara from California, is Mary a descendant of David? You find Mary's true genealogy in Luke chapter 3. And it, through, uh, you have the genealogy of her father, not her mother. I want to repeat that again because many people do not know. You have the genealogy of Mary's father in Luke chapter 3, Heli. And naturally he was of, the, of, of David. Of, and, um, but who was Mary's mother then? Well, in Luke chapter 1, backing up to chapter 1, you find out that she had a cousin whose name was Elizabeth. Now, how do you get to be a cousin to someone? You have to have parents that are brothers and sisters, sisters or brothers. In this case, we know that certainly Elizabeth being of uh, the um, Levitical priesthood, married to a priest of the daughters of Aaron, but she was a Levite. How could she be a cousin to Mary if she's a Levite? Well, because Mary's mother was of the tribe of Levi, being the priest line. Therefore, this is the mystery that many people miss concerning a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, meaning Christ was of the priest line and the king line. He was king of kings and lord of lords, and so it is. Uh, Frank from California, does a mortal soul have a flesh body? Well, it can. Do you know what a mortal soul is? The word um, mortal means um, liable to die. And anybody that isn't saved is in a flesh body and they have a mortal soul, meaning it's liable to die in the lake of fire. Now, what is possible also is you can have a flesh body and have an immortal soul, euthanasia, which means deathlessness. In other words, you have a soul that will never die, but your flesh body will. And when you go into your spiritual body, then you automatically take that immortal soul with you and you go to the proper side of the gulf awaiting para in paradise awaiting judgment, which is great reward for ye. And, and so it is. It's simply a matter of being mortal or immortal. Mortal means liable to die. Immortal means not going to die, spiritually speaking of the soul. Mortal usually has to do with the soul and, uh, and not the flesh, okay? which is your condition in the hereafter. Glenn, Clara and Glenn from Arkansas, you speak of the six-day creation since we were to all be born of woman. How then did the six-day creation come to be and what became of them? Uh, do they have the same way of salvation through Jesus Christ? Answer, yes, whomsoever will. How or why did God choose those particular people not to be born of woman? They were born of woman, okay? He created both male and female and told them to replenish, to repopulate the earth. They were not spiritual bodies. They were they're the races you have with you today. Where did they come from? Well, God created them, and God loves every one of them. God looked, and it was good. Um, um, how did God choose these particular people not to be born of woman? They were, they were all born of woman. Do you know what confuses most people is their not, not having knowledge of the Hebrew language? When it states that Eve is the mother of all living, 
It means eternal life. It means that Christ, the umbilical cord to the umbilical cord, would come through Eth Ha'adam and his wife Eve, which was taken from his DNA, and through him, them would come Christ, and all of the races must believe on Christ to have eternal life. God loves all of his people, but Eve being in the mother line of Christ, you either are in Christ or you're not living. That is why it can be said properly, Eve is the mother of all living. It does not mean flesh. Faye from North Carolina, what do you think of the 10 days of trial will be like for God's elect? Will this happen before we are delivered up or after? Where in the scripture can I do a study on the days of trial? Mark 13. That trial is when you're delivered up before the false Messiah. It gives you every layout of it in Mark chapter 13. You're not to premeditate what you'll say before in. The Holy Spirit will speak through you. That's why God will say in Revelation chapter 2, just before that 10 days is mentioned, that you're rich. Why? Because you have the knowledge of God and God working through you. You're chosen. You're one of God's elect. How precious it is. Most people know there was more to God's word than is written. And therefore, as it is written in both um, uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, and Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, that Smyrna and Philadelphia, only those two churches out of the seven, Christ was pleased with. And it gives you an outline of what each of those seven churches teach. And if the church you're attending, if it doesn't teach what Smyrna and Philadelphia taught, you're in a heap of hurt, friend. God's not pleased with it. Well, what, did, what specifically did those two teach? Who those are that claim to be of our brother Judah, but are the synagogue of Satan, meaning the Kenites, the offspring of Cain, that biblically you have traced it, you know it, and God has made it available to you. This is why God can say in Revelation chapter 9 to Satan when he's cast out of heaven back down to earth, don't you dare touch any of those that have the seal of God in their forehead. That simply means that know who Satan is, that he's coming as the false Messiah, and that you're going to stand against him. Why? Well, Christ has given us power over him as it's written in Luke chapter 10, verse 18. And in Christ's name, that is to say. So he, he can't harm you, can't touch you. And so it is that you make that stand. That 10 days trial is an individual thing for one, in, one entity. It's God's promise that no one person will have to worry about it for over 10 days, and then you're free. You know, you, the Spirit's with you. You're not going to be slaughtered or anything of that nature, but your ministry of, uh, will have been complete through the Holy Spirit. Again, it's, every detail of it is written in Mark 13. Uh, Albert from Tennessee, what kept the six-day creation from sinning long before Adam and Eve on the eighth-day creation? Well, when was the law given? There is no sin until a law is given. You have to break a law to have sinned. You can sin against nature, and they did. You can rest assured, because Satan was with them. He was more subtle than any creature on earth at that time, is what the manuscripts say. And certainly he was there. So um, it, they would have sinned for what we call sin today, but until the law was given, uh, then certainly... Um, uh, when the well, what is the first law? Well, the first law is don't touch Satan. That's to say, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's his body. Don't mess with him. Don't have anything to do with him. That is the first commandment, and it still holds to this day. When he comes as false Messiah, you better not have anything to do with him, other than to stand against him. Uh, Homer from Tennessee. Murray, Brother Murray was referring to the word pharmacy as pharmacia, I believe he said. 
that came from a word in the Old Testament teachings. I don't remember if it was Greek or Hebrew language he was referring to meant pharmacy in the last days. Anyway, the main point was that the scripture was referring to in the last days, and I got from that the drug or pharmacy would play a great role. Well, drug pushers, not, not a, le a legitimate pharmacist. The, the word you're thinking about was from the book of Revelation, as well as other places. It's the word sorcerer. Sorcery is brought on, the word sorcery in the Greek is pharmacia, meaning one that uses drugs to put people on a spiritual high. Okay. And it says there's not going to be any sorcerers in heaven. Okay. They're not going to make it. Sorcerers being pharmacia, that's, that's not a proper legal pharmacist. That's somebody that has a witch's brew and pushes illegal drugs. They're just not going to be there. God's not going to tolerate it. Why would somebody, when we have the Holy Spirit, the comfort to touch you, to raise you, to give you the joy of knowing you have attained eternal life, what more of a high could one want than to mess up your mind with, with um, the imagination or, or the wickedness and the evilness that uh, is presented in this world when you have peace. Peace of mind is one of the most comfortable things that exist. And you find that peace of mind in Christ himself and how precious it is. You don't want anything to do with, uh, with uh, sorcery, which is a religion sponsored by drugs or simply drugs as a habit. Uh, that has nothing to do with doctor prescribed medications. Okay. Luke, Dr. Luke was um, a um, medical doctor, a, a physician, and yet he was a, a, wrote one of the, he created, brought forth one of the gospels for the living God. So there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, this is the illegal things that destroy children and adults. Gary from Pennsylvania, my question is about praying for and working with individuals who in this age are so determined against God and his people. I pray that God's will be done and that they come to repentance What when that happens in the next age when they are spirit beings, will we all Will all they remember the terrible things they have done and said? Will we be able to work with them? Right now, many of these leaders and others are not individuals that I would want to work with or be around as they are so anti-God and anti-America. Well, don't worry, they won't be there. Those that overcome, those that do love God, well, they're worth saving. But uh, that is the purpose of this earth age, is to bring us into a heaven age where we don't have any crud. We don't have any evil people. They will be gone. Well, why, why does God want to do them? So that his children will be safe, secure, and have the love from Almighty God that they deserve when you love him. He returns that love. This particular age is to cull out. God loves all of his children. And as it is written in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, it is his, uh, he is long-suffering, meaning he's got lots of patience. And it is his will that all come to repentance, if they will. They won't. They're not going to come to repentance, many of them. Therefore, they will be gone. And then we will have peace for those that earn it. Uh, and that's so as it should be. God is always fair. You always get what you got coming to you in full. Michael from Florida. If hell doesn't happen until the seventh trump, what is being described in Luke 16 and what is meant by the scripture, hell hath enlarged herself? Well, uh, let, let's, um, 
the lake of fire does not exist, not at the seventh trump, but at the end of the millennium. There is no lake of fire at this time. There, many people misunderstand what that lake of fire is, is in the first place. God is a consuming fire. Consuming means it can, he consumes the evil. They're gone, up in smoke, pew, forever and ever and ever. Uh, they're not going to be around here screaming and yelling and twisting and suffering. That wouldn't be heaven. They're out of here. And that's, that's, to, that's to get rid of them. But that does not happen until Revelation chapter 20, when Satan is locked up for a thousand years and then released for a short season. Well, why is Satan released a short season? To check out those that found religion or found in their heart to follow God during the thousand year period. God's not going to take them until they're tested. If they withstand Satan that time, then they also will overcome. Otherwise, they will go into the lake of fire. And so it is. Uh, all right, we're out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word, but most important, God loves you for it. And, and um, it, when you make His day, boy, is He going to make yours. Why? He, he, wrote you the, he wrote the letter to you. It was written for you that you would have direction, that you would understand His love, that He does love you, and that you could return that love so that He can bless you. All right, we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, listen to me good. You, you stay in His Word. Every day in His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.